All right, we are working our way through the book of Daniel. Uh, so if you have your Bibles with you, open to chapter 7. Uh, a few weeks ago, we started to look at this chapter, and we, uh, I gave you some tools with which to study the prophetic scriptures. And I hope that you are starting to see those and apply those as you work your way through here. Uh, but I didn't want to skip over chapter 7 too quickly. Uh, a lot of you have been part of the Revelation study that we've been doing in our evening services. But not all of you. And so I don't want to skip ahead without giving you some groundwork of what the context is of what we're talking about. Um, if, if I do that, some of you will be confused, um, and if I do it, some of you will be like, well, I've heard this before. Uh, so uh, take this as a, I'm learning this uh, in a more deeper way as we work our way through some of the familiar passages as well. So Daniel 7, as I mentioned before, is the first of four visions that Daniel has personally. Remember, the first vision that he had wasn't his vision, it was the vision of King Nebuchadnezzar, and Daniel interpreted it. Now that was in chapter 2 of Daniel, and that is a parallel vision to chapter 7, which we're looking at now. But this vision was personal for him, it was one that came directly to him for uh, him to be able to uh, receive interpretation over, and to even ask questions about. So first of four visions, uh, and we'll see the, the rest of the visions in chapter 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 uh, as we get to those different chapters. Um, to gain a, a better understanding of chapter 7, correlating with chapter 2 really helps us because it's from two different perspectives. See, Nebuchadnezzar... He saw the four kingdoms that Daniel is seeing in chapter 7, he saw them represented as precious metals. Remember, it was the head of gold, and then there was silver and bronze and iron mixed with clay. And uh, he was seeing that as precious metals because he was seeing it from an earthly perspective. And uh, he, if you remember, his response to it was, well, if I'm the head of gold, I might as well make an entire statue of gold. And then we had the problem with the fiery furnace. But chapter 7 is the heavenly perspective of the same events that are happening because God calls them beastly. He calls them beasts. It's his perspective of these evil empires that work their way through history, culminating in the great end time battle of the Antichrist trying to uh, destroy the people of God, trying to hinder Jesus from coming again to set up his earthly kingdom. That's really what the battle is about. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. Satan, uh, he knows the scriptures better than you and me. He really does. I mean, he's had longer to study the scriptures, right? So he understands them. He knows God. He still currently has access to the throne room of God. His desire in everything that he does is to kill and destroy in order to hinder the plan of God. See, if he can destroy the nation of Israel, I don't know if you uh, have been following current events, but uh, there was a, a protest recently in Iran where they, uh, they set up a clock, a countdown clock. Uh, how many years was it, Julie? 23. 23 years. The countdown clock, and the countdown is 23 years to the destruction of the nation of Israel. And that, that's, you know, Iran hates Israel, a lot of the Arab world hates Israel, uh, goes back all the way to Abraham that we've been studying in Sunday school uh, because of Ishmael and, uh, and then through, through his line and other lines, the Arabic people came and there was a prophecy on them that they would be at war with their brothers. Uh, and that prophecy we see fulfilled in our day. Well, Iran has said in 23 years we will have destroyed the nation of Israel. That is Satan's desire because a Jewish king cannot rule a Jewish nation if there is no Jewish nation. Right? And so Jesus is coming as a Jewish king. 
Scripture is very clear in telling us that the household of Israel will be saved. They will be uh, accepting Jesus as their Messiah. In fact, Jesus said he won't come again until the people, the leadership of the nation of Israel say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's when he enters into Jerusalem after that great battle against the Antichrist and his armies. So there's uh, a lot of things that are happening presently in the world where we can see Satan is trying to kill and destroy in order to hinder the plan of God. We as the church, just as I was teaching the kids, we have a responsibility to intercede, to pray against those things, to bind Satan and his demons, to bind the effect that they have in the spiritual realm, and to loose the things of the Lord. That is part of what our call is as the church of Jesus Christ. And so uh, we come to this passage and looking at both angles of Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, we see God looks at this and says, this is bad. This is evil and wicked and it shows the heart of man in these empires and how they have uh, taken over the world at different times in history and how it leads to the Antichrist at the time of the end. And then looking at what man says about it, and, and you can see that in our news reporting, man says we are at the greatest time in history. We're at the highest uh, uh, ability of our thoughts. We're, we're doing so many great things and never has it been better for mankind with technology and all this. I've got windstorm happening here. Uh, and so we need to recognize that what man says about history is not accurate. What God says about it is accurate. And we as the church need to have a right perspective on that. So, uh, in chapter 2 of Daniel, we had the head of gold that represents the Babylonian Empire. We had the chest and arms of silver, which represent the Medo-Persian Empire. And then the belly and the thighs of bronze, which represented the Greek Empire. And the legs with the feet and toes of iron and clay, which represent the Antichrist's empire as foreshadowed by the Roman Empire. If you, uh, uh, I don't know how many of you are history buffs or uh, remember any of the history that you learned in school, but it's important for us to understand history because God has given us examples of what it will be like in the final seven years of history, of natural history, before Christ comes to set up his thousand year reign. Uh, so the two legs that were in this statue, they represent the two divisions of the Roman Empire. If you know your history, the Roman Empire was divided uh, around the time of Constantine. Emperor Constantine was around 330 something AD, and uh, he uh, es essentially, the, the kingdom split in two, with Rome being the Western Empire, and then what is known as Constantinople, uh, or Byzantium, or uh, present-day Istanbul in Turkey, that was the headquarters of the Eastern Empire. Not only did the empire split, but the church split. There was the Roman Catholic Church, they insist on the Roman title, Right? Because it's different from the Eastern Orthodox Church. They came from the same, but they split when the empire split. So these prophecies here, they have to do with, the, the when you see the two legs, we're meant to understand those were two kingdoms of the same, of the Roman. And they come into these ten toes that are mixed with iron and clay. And Daniel 7 is going to give us more insight into that. We'll, uh, we'll be looking at... What are those ten different uh, structures in that empire? We'll look at that. And then in that uh, Daniel chapter 2, we have the image that is struck by the stone that was not cut out by human hands. It speaks of Jesus and his eternal kingdom coming to crush all of the wicked empires. So in Daniel 7, let me read the first eight verses here. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, 
Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And the four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. Let me pause there. So again, this is in Belshazzar's reign. He came after Nebuchadnezzar. There was one more in between there. Uh, Belshazzar, he reigned for 13 years. And in this first year, Daniel has this dream. Uh, he is having a night vision. He's writing down the main facts, we're told. But he mentions here the stirring of the Great Sea. Now, the Great Sea in Scripture is the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, the reason it's called the Great Sea, the reason it's always the focus point, is because that is where world history takes place. You know, we, we're kind of removed from that in North America and South America, but the central events of Scripture take place in that uh, Middle Eastern area where the Mediterranean Sea is. So this Great Sea is described in numerous passages in Numbers and Joshua and a whole bunch of other places. But the sea represents the kingdoms of man being filled with chaos. The great sea is being stirred. Okay? The empires that are highlighted in this vision include those nations that are around the Mediterranean Sea. The nation, nations of the Middle East, the nations of Europe, and the nations of North Africa. Um, it also says that uh, he saw the four winds of heaven that were stirring up the great sea. Now, uh, these winds are angelic as well as demonic powers. We have to gain an understanding of the spiritual realm to be able to comprehend what happens in the prophetic. So it's important we understand these are uh, angelic and demonic activity that are stirring up the great sea. In another passage in Daniel, we'll get to uh, an understanding of there are princes over different regions of the world uh, by invitation of the people. See, when you have a wicked ruler, uh, you know, in, in our context as we, as we think about world affairs right now, uh, we think of North Korea or Iran or Syria, different areas of the, of the world. These rulers, we're told in Scripture, God sets up kingdoms and tears them down. We're told in Scripture that He is the one who, in, who uh, sets up kings and, uh, and who removes kingship. Uh, but we're also told in Scripture that when we invite demonic activity, when we embrace wickedness, it actually allows uh, demonic strongholds. And that's what happens even in nations. That's why we see uh, rulers who are wicked rulers doing things that don't make sense. They're, they're crazy if you think about trying to establish peace or to rule your people well. Um, it doesn't make sense the way they act because they are guided by demonic forces. And what did I say at the beginning is Satan's goal? To destroy, to kill, to hinder the plan of God. That's why we as the church need to be active in our intercession. So uh, we have the four winds. They symbolize these spiritual forces, both angelic and demonic. And they're stirring up the nations of the Middle East, Europe, and North Africa. God is the one who orchestrates history. He has ordained for things to get worse and worse, so that when Christ actually comes again, wickedness will be at its fullest, at its fullness. Scripture talks about the restraint of God being lifted off of the wickedness. And, and evil. There, right now we have, under the grace of God, we have protection from Him in that His hand has been suppressing wickedness. Uh, if you think of the judgments we've been studying in Sunday school, uh, the flood of Noah was a judgment on the fullness of man's wickedness. The judgment at the Tower of Babel was a restraint on man's wickedness. To, to prohibit man's wickedness from progressing too quickly. 
God has a plan to allow wickedness to come to fullness, but not until it is time to judge. See, man's wickedness under one language and one culture progressed so quickly that in uh, thousands and something years, 1,400 years approximately, he had to bring judgment on all of mankind because of their collective wickedness. So God said, I'm going to restrain that wickedness so that it will progress slowly. It's going to come to fullness, not because of his design that he wants that, but because of the heart of man, which as we're told in scripture is desperately wicked and deceitful. Right? So um, we, we have no excuse for our sinfulness. Uh, we must, the only escape is to come under Christ and to receive forgiveness for our sins. So these four winds of heaven, they stir up the great sea. And then we see four great beasts that come up from the sea, each different from the other we're told. So I'm going to look at these uh, beasts a little bit today. The first beast we're told is, actually let's go ahead and read this next section, starting with verse 4. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. So this, this is the first beast, a lion with eagle's wings, which as we know from Daniel chapter 2, this represents the Babylonian Empire, the head of gold. The lion and the eagle are mentioned numerous times in scripture, and they uh, usually refer to, when they're used in scripture, they refer to the Babylonian Empire. Uh, a lion is a, a beast that is strong, uh, it's majestic, you know, we even call it the king of the jungle. Uh, it's courageous. Uh, it had eagle's wings, we're told, which speaks of the swiftness of uh, the military conquest that this empire was able to bring. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar and his father um, conquered most of the known world at that time in a very short amount of time with uh, extreme strength and courage as they moved forward. But it tells us also its wings were plucked off. They, uh, this empire was humbled. And in specific, King Nebuchadnezzar, who was the greatest king of that empire, he was humbled, as we looked at in Daniel chapter 4. And he went through uh, a, a divine humbling of a few years where he was tamed. It says, a man's heart was given to this beast, right? It's talking about a beast. A man's heart was given to it. So it was tamed. It was domesticated. Uh, we're told it was made to stand. If you think of a lion, uh, you don't normally see a lion walking around on two legs, right? The only time that I've seen a picture of it is when it's pouncing, right? But when it's made to stand, uh, if, you try, if you have a cat, try doing that sometime. Have it walk around on its two legs. It's very awkward, right? It's not able to do that and to function. It's not able to devour things or kill things in that position. So it was given a heart, a heart of a man to be tamed and it was made to stand, made by God to stand. Instead of being like a lion, uh, it was uh, not able to attack any longer or to devour others. Uh, so the, the reference to the wings being plucked off, being made to stand on two feet like a man, being given a heart of a man, is really seen very clearly in Nebuchadnezzar's experience in Daniel chapter 4, where he goes insane for, uh, I think it was seven years, until he repented and God restored him to his kingdom. But Babylon was never the same anymore. In fact, when, uh, when uh, Belshazzar is on the scene, these are the final years of the empire. There isn't any more conquest. It's just maintenance and it's lethargy. And so there's no, uh, there's no ability of this empire to continue being as fierce as it had been when it started. So then we're introduced to the second beast in verse 5. And suddenly 
Another beast, a second, like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. So this second beast is described as a bear with ribs in its mouth. It refers to the Persian <coughs> Empire. Um, and and the, the Medo-Persian Empire, these were two civilizations that worked together to conquer the world. We're told that this bear was raised up on one side because what ended up happening uh, under Cyrus the Great in 550 BC, Cyrus conquered the Medes. See, they had been splitting their responsibility and the Medes were in charge of this area, the Persians were in charge of another area, uh, but they were one empire. Well, Cyrus decided he wanted to be the lone emperor and so the bear was raised up on one side. He conquered the Medes and took control of the empire. This uh, Medo-Persian Empire was like a fierce bear, which really gives us the idea of slow but steady. Uh, I don't know, uh, Rachel, have you ever been pursued by a bear in Alaska? One. Yeah? So what did you do? It was a small one, so we just stood our ground in the other one. Okay. If it would have been a big, big one, what would you have done? Probably shot it. Okay, good. You had a gun. That's excellent. Now, if you didn't have a gun... You don't run, depending on what kind of bear, right? So no, different kinds. Ever. Ever? Okay, don't run, just get eaten. Okay. So, um, slow but steady, strong military progress is the picture of this bear. The bear, after the lion, was the second most dreaded predator at the time in that region of the world. In fact, if you remember uh, uh, Elisha's bald head, anybody remember that? Huh? Go up, bald head. Yeah, the 70 youths that were crying out uh, and making fun of him, right? And uh, he prayed and the uh, mama bear came out and killed all 70 of them, right? So, um, bad, bad story. But, uh, Don't make fun of all people. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> uh, so the bear was larger than the lion. It was more cumbersome than the lion, but it had great strength. So it's raised up on one side, and it says that it had three ribs in its mouth. These three ribs are the three empires that it devoured on its path to becoming that second empire. There was uh, the, the, uh, the people of Lydia, which was a significant kingdom, a major kingdom in that world. There was Babylon, and then there was Egypt. So after he, they conquered Babylon, they went and they conquered Egypt. And so that was these three ribs in its mouth. And God mandated, it says, this beast was told to arise to devour much flesh. God actually mandated that Persia would arise and conquer more nations. See, the Lord is the one who is sovereign over these affairs. And he has a plan of why things uh, are supposed to happen the way they do. So then comes the third beast, and this is verse 6. After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. So there's this leopard. Uh, Greece is the empire that comes after the Medo-Persians. Uh, who remembers the leader that conquered the known world? What was his name? Alexander the Great. Uh, why was he called the Great? Because he conquered everything. He was only like 30 years old. And he actually wept when he realized that there was nothing else to conquer. He was so fast like a leopard. Leopard is a super fast animal. Uh, fierce and agile. Uh, cunning as well. And uh, Greece was known for its quickness and its cunningness. Now it says that it had four wings of a bird, which again speaks of that amazing speed in its military conquest. But not only did it have these four wings, it also had four heads. 
Now, it's amazing, this is happening, this is being prophesied hundreds of years before. And that's why so many secular scholars don't believe that Daniel was a real person, because they say, well, how could he possibly have known what was going to happen in history? Well, he knew because God told him. And here's what happened. After the death of Alexander the Great, his kingdom was divided into four kingdoms, one given to each of his four generals. And we'll look at more specifics of that in Daniel chapter 8, because it really goes into detail in, in that uh, chapter. So he had four generals that uh, each received a portion of Alexander's kingdom, and they actually became different kingdoms. Have you ever heard of the Seleucid kingdom? No? No history people. Well, you hear about it soon. Anyway, that was one of the generals that received uh, a portion of that. And out of that came uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, which is who we'll talk about when we look at chapter 8. So dominion is spoken about. Uh, the Greek government, as well as the Greek culture, was brought to the entire known world. Uh, we even today still have the effects and the influences of Greek philosophy and Greek medicine in our society. Uh, what Alexander did, he wasn't just interested in conquering, but he was interested in devouring other cultures. And he brought the Greek culture to the known world. He won them over to the Greek language. It became the trade language. Uh, he won them over to the way of life that the Greeks lived, and this uh, it's called the Hellenization of the world. Um, it's another term for Greekification. <coughs> Hellenization sounds nice. So, uh, fourth beast. The fourth beast, verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now it's interesting, the three previous empires were assigned an animal that we recognize. This empire is so fierce, so wicked, there was no comparison to any example that we would recognize. So we're told, uh, first off I need to say, this, this fourth beast, although chronologically came the Roman Empire, this is still in existence now, this fourth beast. The Roman Empire still influences our way of life today. And the Antichrist will come out of that. And we'll talk about the different uh, aspects of this prophecy in relationship to the Antichrist. So the Roman Empire is a foreshadowing of what Antichrist will do. Um, it had ten horns, we are told. This is actually still future. Okay, so uh, remember, in prophecy, oftentimes it's very broad, so it'll span, even though our mind is always chronological, okay, what happens next? When God gives prophecy, he oftentimes paints a broad picture, and then he'll single out an event within that broad picture, and that's what's happening here. So when it talks about these ten uh, horns, uh, or the ten toes of the statue, this is something that has not yet come to fulfillment. I think, personally, that the European Union is a start of that, but it is not the end product. It will still look different, um, but I think it is a beginning so that we have a picture of what this could look like. So these, it had ten horns. There's going to be a ten-nation confederation. This is talked to us in, uh, in Daniel chapter 2, as well, as well as here in 7, also in Revelation 12, Revelation 13, 17, uh, and a few other passages where it explains to us who these ten horns are, or these ten toes are. They are ten kings, we're told later in chapter 7, uh, who shall arise from this kingdom. So the ten horns are a ten-nation confederation that will align themselves with the Antichrist. He will come up as a little horn, we are told, 
and will we'll come out of this ten nation confederation, these ten will band together and actually three of them will oppose Antichrist and Antichrist will have them killed. And then there will be the seven that are banded together with Antichrist. So these are ten end time nations that are symbolized by the ten horns in chapter 7 and the ten toes in Daniel chapter 2. We're told this fourth beast is dreadful and terrible. Uh, in fact, Daniel has such a, uh, a, a distressing response that we're told that he was troubled, he was sick. In verse 15 and then further down, um, we're, we're told in verse 28 that he was troubled, deeply troubled by the terror of this beast. Remember, he's just seen visions of these terrible beasts. But this one in particular absolutely uh, brings him to his knees in prayer and asking for revelation of what this means. Uh, you know, if we aren't troubled by what Daniel shared about the Antichrist, then it really means that we have not yet understood what he saw. The Antichrist, when he arises, it is going to be literally hell on earth. In fact, Scripture says as much. It says that Satan will give over his dominion to this demonized man. So we can't even imagine how terrible the reign of this man will be. And we praise the Lord that he is in control, that he can protect, and that he has shortened the time of this man's empire. If you look at the other empires, how many years they lasted. Antichrist will only have essentially three and a half years from the point that he reveals himself and sets himself up. So that's a short time compared to the hundreds of years that uh, the, the Medo-Persians or the, or the Grecians had, or even the Romans, they had a thousand years and beyond. So thank the Lord that this wicked man's reign will be short. Um, it's said that he tramples the residue with its feet. Now, picture this for a minute. Uh, this beast tramples things. What happens when you trample on something? It's crushed, it's destroyed, right? What is left after you trample on something? Residue. Dust. And what does it say he does with the residue? tramples it. This man is unrelentless. He just continues to trample and to destroy. It's a continuing of trampling a nation after it's already been defeated. Uh, the Antichrist, we're told in Scripture, in numerous passages, he will show no mercy or kindness uh, towards those that he conquers. He's ruthless and cruel. He'll crush and trample everything uh, that's not initially destroyed in his hostile military takeover. Uh, Daniel tells us this fourth beast was different than the others. Uh, the difference is demonic. It will be fueled by demonic power, uh, energized by demonic power. Uh, there'll be uh, a new order of evil and cruelty and supernatural demonic power. Uh, remember in Revelation it says that when Satan is kicked out of heaven, that's when he hands over his, uh, his authority, his dominion to the Antichrist. But it says he has such rage because he knows his time is short. Now right now, the hand of God is suppressing wickedness. He's restraining evil. But at the point in the future, when this prophetic calendar kickstarts, God will allow wickedness to come to its fullness, and Antichrist will uh, reign in terror. Uh, while focusing on the ten horns, Daniel saw a little horn. It's in verse 8. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. Okay, so this uh, little horn comes up. It speaks of a political leader who starts out uh, as insignificant, as little. Uh, 
Um, he has a small sphere of authority, a small sphere of influence. That's why uh, in our Revelation study, uh, did anyone remember what scripture says kickstarts the final seven years? There's the signing of a peace treaty, right? At that point, these things are going to kickstart and, and be moving forward. But I believe we won't know with assurance who of the signers of this treaty is the Antichrist yet. Because I think he will arise and prove himself at that three and a half year mark when the abomination of desolation takes place. That is what scripture tells us. This is when you will know. In fact, Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation take place, flee to the hills. Right? That's what he told the Jewish nation. So... Uh, uh, the seven years kickstart with the signing of a treaty for seven years, a treaty of peace with the nation of Israel. There'll be nations involved in the signing of this treaty. It wouldn't surprise me if it's the Ten Nation Confederation that is uh, spearheading this signing of the treaty. There may be other nations involved with it. I think the Arabic nations will have to be involved with that in order for there to be this counterfeit peace. But then... Three and a half years happen. There's all kinds of things happening behind the scene. The per church is being persecuted because we are the intolerant ones. And then three and a half years uh, is where that mark where Antichrist becomes very clearly visible and Satan gives his dominion over to this demonized man. So, uh, an example that uh, I think helps us to, to understand what this can look like is if you look at the history of Hitler. When Hitler first came on the political scene in 1928, where he actually he was known before that in 1920s, but in 1928 he ran for political office in Germany and he received only 2% of the vote. 1928. But then, within five years, he is the supreme leader of that nation wanting to expand his empire. So his, ri his rise to power came suddenly, and that's what will happen with this little horn. Small sphere of influence at first, but he will rise. Uh, we're told this horn had eyes like a man. Uh, really what that speaks of, when, when scripture talks about the eyes, it's talking about being able to see things and, and talking about intelligence. So this man will be uh, highly educated. He will have a great understanding of how the world functions. We're told it had a mouth speaking pompous words. The Antichrist will speak uh, arrogant words. Uh, they will create fear, threats, um, but also will create excitement in false promises. Um, his arrogant words are actually emphasized four different times in this very chapter, in verse 8, verse 11, verse 20 and 25. So we know that he's going to be a man of many words, uh, both that will terrify as well as that will excite the nations, because they obviously align themselves with him. We're told he speaks blasphemies against the true God. Uh, he will claim things essentially about himself that are shocking. Uh, he would be speaking with terrible boldness against God as we look through the next Verses we'll look at those next week, uh, but uh, where where he is even in the in the courts of God speaking with arrogance against God. Um, we're told there are three horns that he plucks out. These uh, three of those first ten horns, there are three kings that are plucked out by the roots. They're killed. They're overthrown by the Antichrist. And this is part of how he seizes control of this ten-nation confederation and comes on the world stage as a leader. Um, the church is going to understand uh, these events as a prophetic sign of the times. And I'm going to uh, pause here in, in what I want to share with you about this particular passage because I want to remind you of why... We are studying this. Um, I believe the Lord has placed a calling on me 
to train us, to equip us for what is to come. I, I truly believe, whether it's in my generation or in the generation of my kids, that these things will take place. I think we are moving through history so rapidly that uh, the time is short. And not only does the church have a responsibility to preach the gospel uh, of salvation and to draw people into the family of God, but the church has a responsibility to learn how to function as the people of God. Jesus, when he came, what did he preach? The kingdom of heaven. That's right. That's exactly what he came to preach. He actually, if you look at all the teaching that he taught, he was teaching the culture of his kingdom. He was teaching how we should function as part of his family. And so uh, we need to really understand the purpose of being familiar with these prophetic scriptures. These are sure to take place. Now everything that Daniel prophesied came to pass exactly as it was written. So we can be assured that those things that haven't yet taken place <coughs> will come to pass exactly as written. We as the church need to understand these things. And Jesus has commissioned us and assigned us that task. Uh, if you want to turn with me briefly over to Mark chapter 13. Uh, there's parallel passages in uh, the Gospels when Jesus is teaching on the end times. Matthew 24 is the, the most extensive teaching of Jesus on the end times. Mark 13 is a parallel passage, and then also Luke chapter 17 and 21. But here in Mark 13, uh, Jesus is, is talking about the signs of the times, and he's explaining things. And then he says in verse 23, he says, for, uh, actually back up to, to verse 22, false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. And I think we are seeing that in so many denominations that are proclaiming a false Christ. And they are not uh, following the, the, the clear teaching of scripture and what they're saying. They're deceiving people en masse. And then he says in verse 23, but take heed, that means pay attention, watch out. He says, see, I've told you all things beforehand. Right? Everything that he has just gone through, he explained the events of what happens before the seven years. He even explained some of them what happened during the seven years and what happens during the kingdom, uh, the thousand year reign. He said, I've told you all these things beforehand. Now, uh, we can have one of two responses. And if you think of your own children, think of how you've seen them respond. When you tell them something is going to happen, there's one of two responses. One is that they listen and they prepare and they get ready to go. Like when we go on, on trips somewhere, we've got a pack, right? And then we've got to load the car. Well, inevitably, one of our many children will forget something because they didn't prepare. They weren't ready to go. And at some point, I'm done waiting for them. And things are going to just leave, right? In fact, a few times we almost left a kid, right? Because they were still in the bathroom. But we as the church, we have been told beforehand what is going to take place. And told beforehand what our role is. Where I was teaching the kids at the start of of this message was that we are called by God. He's given us the keys of the kingdom to unlock doors, to loose the things of the Lord, and to bind the things of Satan. He says when we do that on earth, it is done in heaven. We, we partner with his heart. We are active in the spiritual realm, and we need to understand that. Uh, even tonight as we come together to, to worship the Lord, that is an act of warfare. We are doing battle when we sing the praises of God. When we agree together in unity. And then when we intercede for different things, like tonight for the Baptist Children's Home, and for the, the kids that they minister to, and even the kids in this community that need a loving environment. When we intercede for those things, it shifts things in the heavenlies. Our role is to prepare this planet for the coming of Jesus. And we're doing a poor job 
uh, of, of preparing people. Because all we're doing is, is preaching one part of the message. We're preaching just the forgiveness part. We're not even barely preaching the life change part. Right? It's like, oh, just, just keep doing what you're doing. Jesus will forgive you over and over and over again. It's ridiculous. We are called to be new creations. Right? He, he, make, he transforms us into something that is useful to him. The entry point is forgiveness. That's the entry point. Everything that happens after that is life. And we need to know how to live that life. So he said he told us beforehand, and down in verse 37 he says, and what I say to you, I say to all. Right? So some people, they like to look at the gospel and say, well, he only said that to his 12 disciples. He didn't say it to me. And he says, he says very clearly here, what I say to you, to the 12, I say to all, watch. Be familiar with what is going on in the world. Now, I'm not saying you have to have the news channel on 24-7. That's counterproductive to what you're supposed to be doing. But be informed as to what is going on so that you can ask the Lord how to pray about the different issues that are happening around the world. All of this is going to come to the point where we will see these milestones happen. And I think we are living in the days where those are beginning. Worship team, come on up. As they come, in Matthew 24, verse 25, Jesus says the same reiteration. See, I have told you beforehand. Uh, don't be deceived is actually the, the main exhortation of Jesus. The thing that he mentioned more than anything else in his teachings is not to be deceived. So, as the church, we engage with God through worship. We shift things in the heavenlies through warfare. Singing, praising God, interceding for things. And so we do that now as we join our voices in song.